Hey, deserving listeners, today we're going to talk about Munchausen by proxy or factitious disorder imposed by another. Listeners Jeanette, Salem, and Anne all have asked me to talk about this in recent times, and so here we go. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a therapist and a professor. The reason why I'm talking about this now is not only because listeners Jeanette, Salem, and Ann have asked me to talk about it, but a new documentary by HBO called Mommy Dead and Dearest came out, I think recently, and I just watched it. And man, this is an amazing documentary. Highly recommend it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this won the Oscar come that, you know, February or whenever the Oscars are next year. It's well made. It's compelling stuff. It uh, illuminates something that happens sometimes and we need to know more about it. Also kind of points to our medical system in terms of some flaws there. So not only am I going to talk about not only am I going to talk about Munchausen by proxy or a factitious disorder imposed by another, but I'm also going to be talking in detail about this documentary. I recommend that before you listen to this episode, you go out and watch this uh, on HBO. If you have HBO, you can watch it on demand. Mommy Dead and Dearest, uh, excellent documentary. All right, so let's talk about Munchausen by proxy. Uh, the name has changed over the years, and in other countries, it's it's referred to by something else. Uh, you know, multiple personality disorder. People still call it multiple personality disorder, but it is formally known as dissociative identity disorder. Also, manic depression. People still refer to manic depression, but its technical name is bipolar. And it's similar to Munchausen by proxy. A lot of people still refer to it as Munchausen by proxy, but its technical name is factitious, factitious disorder imposed by another. It, it has two different kinds. You have, you have factitious disorder imposed by another or factitious disorder imposed on the self. In the past, you had uh, Munchausen by proxy or Munchausen or just Munchausen. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, uh, Munchausen by proxy is when you fake or induce an illness in a child or someone that you're taking care of. And the motivation is often to get sympathy, attention, or care, or some other kind of uh, social benefit. It could also be for just fraud, you, you know, getting money and that kind of thing. But usually it's, it's to get sympathy because there are easier ways to make money if you're trying to make a quick buck. The, this is not an easy way to make money. Um, it's also different from malingering, which some people might say, well, isn't that malingering? And it's, it's a bit of a tough line to draw, but the usually malingering, we, we call something malingering when you are acting sick or mentally ill for personal gain. Like a classic example is someone commits a, a murder or something and they want to get out of responsibility for the crime by acting as though they have schizophrenia and they were not on their meds or something. And therefore they can claim that they were not sane at the time of the crime and get out of a certain kind of sentence. And so they will malinger by acting as though they have schizophrenia when in fact they don't have schizophrenia. So, so that's an example of malingering. Now, factitious disorder uh, and factitious, dis, you know, factitious disorder imposed by another, they don't have obvious rewards is the way that it's defined. So malingering has obvious rewards. There's a, there's a very obvious reason as to why someone would malinger or fake a, an illness or a mental illness. With factitious disorder and fact, factitious disorder posed by another, it's not always clear what the person is getting out of it. There often are gains, but they're not, they're not like a super uh, immediate, if that makes any sense. So, but honestly, it's, it's hard to differentiate between malingering and factitious disorder. And so, um, and I'll get more into that in, uh, in a second here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about it right now because I'm looking at my notes and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, not all the experts agree that it's a legitimate mental illness because it, it all comes down to 
whether or not you think or whether or not the research demonstrates that people are doing this because they can't help it or not. For instance, let's say that these people, uh, you know, parents who fake illnesses in their children are doing it because they want to get sympathy and they want people to feel sorry for them and they want people to give them money, you know, and charity and stuff. Well, that is, you know, a straight up crime, right? And, and, but why do we have to label that as a mental disorder? If someone was stealing money, you know, someone was working at the Burger King and they're taking money out of the register because they want, you know, money. Or a better example would be someone, is, someone, um, accidentally crashes their car and when they get home and their parents are saying like how did how did the car get crashed and the teenager is like well someone hit me i I was just sitting at a stoplight and someone just hit me and then they ran off and it was you know a hit and run well that teenager is lying straight up to their parent for a personal gain right they're trying to get out of that personal responsibility or they're trying to get insurance or whatever. They're, they're lying to get something out of, out of other people. Well, we don't call that a mental disorder. We just call that lying. We just call that manipulation. We call that fraud or whatever we call it. So when someone fakes illnesses in their own children to, to get something out of society, why do we have to call that a mental disorder? Why don't we just call it illegal behavior or bad behavior or, or child abuse. You know, another example is if a parent is, is physically abusing their children when, you know, they get angry sometimes and they, they physically beat their child as defined by the law, that person doesn't necessarily suffer from mental disorder. And we don't have to apply a mental disorder to that child abuse perpetrator. We just say that person is committing child abuse. So, in this situation, when you have a parent who is faking illnesses in their child, why are we calling it a disorder? Why, why, why don't we just call it illegal or child abuse or something like that? Well, so the controversy is some people believe that people who do this, they're not exactly in control of their behavior, and, and it's, it's a compulsion similar to anorexia or something, and therefore worthy of mental illness status. But there's just not a lot of research out there and, and it's been debated over the years and it's hard to differentiate between someone who is doing it compulsively or as motivated by what we might consider to be a mental illness or someone who's just doing it because they're just not a nice person, you know? Uh, it's also controversial because sometimes there are cases in which the legal system tries to figure out whether or not someone is uh, guilty of killing their children or not. And I'll get more into some of the famous cases. Essentially, there are cases in which children will die mysteriously and their people will come out and say, well, obviously this, this mother has Munchausen by proxy or factitious disorder uh, imposed by another. And the uh, factitious disorder imposed by another, by the way, is just a terrible name. It's, 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 basically you're, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's a very weird name. (laughs) Um, Now Munchausen by proxy has got to be the weirdest name ever, because, you know, if you just said Munchausen by proxy to someone, uh, they'd say like, what language are you speaking? (laughs) Or is that a movie? Or it sounds like a matrix movie, Munchausen by proxy, you know, so, uh, but factitious disorder imposed by another, I don't know, it just, it's funny. Uh, personally, I guess I would rather it be phrased factitious disorder imposed onto another. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, because it sort of implies that it's... Anyway, let's move forward here. Um, so basically, there would be these uh, cases where uh, children would die mysteriously and the mother would be accused of having Munchausen by proxy and uh, therefore accused of murdering the children. And then later on, there's evidence that comes out that the mother had nothing to do with the disorder or nothing to do with the uh, death of the children. And it was, you know, was an accident or some mysterious illness or something and, and vice versa. There will be children who die mysteriously and no one cares. And later on they're like, wait, you know, Munchausen by proxy. And so there's just a lot of 
uh, over the years in legal battles and in the media, there's just been a lot of, and among uh, clinicians, there's just been, and researchers, there's just been a lot of uh, controversy around whether or not this thing actually exists or if it's um, how we understand it. So anyway, uh, the first thing I'll say is that it's very rare. It's it's a very, uh, uh, you know, according to research and according to just anecdotal evidence, it's a, it's a very rare condition for someone to suffer from. It's a very rare thing for people to do. But it's hard to study the prevalence rates because people don't admit that they're doing it, right? So there could be millions of people around the world who are doing these kinds of things. And if they're if they're really good at manipulating people, we'll just never know that they have it. But honestly, in my experience, it's pretty easy to detect it, it because people with Munchausen by proxy end up dragging their children to so many doctors and it's, and it, and it's so compulsive and it's so over the top that eventually one of the clinicians will start raising the question. And then once that question is raised and the people start working together, it, it usually can be, uh, triangulated, so to speak. But having said that, it, a lot of people, including in this documentary that, are, that I'll talk about, can manipulate the medical system pretty easily because of the way the medical system is or, you know, set up and the way, they, the way their culture is, which I'll get more into later. So, so it's hard to study, but it appears to be one of the more rare disorders in the DSM meaning that, you know, the prevalence rates among the normal population might be, you know, less than 0.1% or something, you know, it's extremely rare. Studies have shown that out of the people who are in hospitals or, you know, people who are in hospitals that have parents that are dragging their kids into the hospital, it seems that maybe about 1% of the patients have Munchausen's or factitious disorder involved either they are the ones who have factitious disorder and they're faking their own illnesses or they're uh, you know people who are being cared for by people with factitious disorder so uh, so you know about one percent pretty so it's pretty rare if you're just doing a wide swath of, of patients in a random hospital but when you think that there are you know tens of thousands of patients in hospitals in a particular region, you know, it's a, it's a sizable number that are likely involved in factitious disorder. Okay, so to, again, just to be clear about what it is, it's when a caregiver deliberately exaggerates or fabricates or induces health problems in someone that they are caring for. So a caregiver, which could be a parent or doesn't have to be a parent, but just a caregiver who deliberately, on purpose, exaggerates health problems or fabricates health problems or induces health problems in someone that they're caring for. And this victim can be a child. It could be a dependent adult, like an older adult who is dependent on someone else. Or it even could be a pet. There's not a lot of research on that, but uh, there are uh, there is talk about what that it could be done on a pet, which just you know really breaks your heart, right? And incidentally, it can result in the death of the person being cared for. Literature suggests that uh, an increase in physician awareness to, of this disorder can prevent or reduce its morbidity and mortality, meaning its prevalence and its death rate. So we really need to be educating people about it. And that's part of the reason why I want to do this episode is because I want, I want more people to know about this. And I think that the documentary... Mommy Dead and Dearest. That's also kind of a weird, Mommy Dead and Dearest. Um, kind of a weird title. But anyway, this documentary will absolutely raise the awareness because it's such a compelling documentary. I wish, it, I wish it was on Netflix or YouTube or something because not a lot of people have HBO. But anyway, in the literature, the, the symptoms are classified into four main groups. They have people who poison. They have people who bleed. And they have people who will start infections. And there are people who injure. And so factitious disorder can either be done on the self or on someone else. And so, so people will poison themselves or poison another person. They will cause bleeding in themselves or another person. They'll cause infections in themselves or another person, or they will injure themselves or another person. The most frequently reported problems for, um, by proxy 
uh, for the person being taken care of. So when someone with uh, Munchausen by proxy, when they drag their the person that they're caring for into the hospital or when they call 911 or call the physician, here are the things that they will say that the person they're caring for has. The most common is apnea, which is interesting. Uh, mostly because it's usually a child and it's usually the mother. So it's usually like a young child, like three to four years old. And so apnea is, for whatever reason, one of the things. And that's one of the things that's in the documentary. Apnea was the first thing that the mother uh, came to, which is interesting because I, I imagine that people with Munchausen by proxy, they don't get together and say, okay, let's all do this one. There's probably not websites that say like, here's how you trick your physician. It's, it's just interesting to see what sort of symptoms emerge in a culture, you know, regarding um, uh, just, you know, what what's popular. It's It's akin to like, what are popular baby names and how that changes over time. It's just interesting to see what emerges in the culture. But anyway, apnea is uh, the most frequent uh, symptom that's reported by the caregiver. Second is anorexia or feeding problems. Third is diarrhea in the, in the child. Four is seizures. Five is blue skin. Blue skin meaning that the child isn't getting enough oxygen. Next is behavioral problems, which I have a hard time understanding what that means exactly, behavioral problems. Anyway, moving on, asthma, allergies, and fevers, and uh, and lesser reported symptoms of the person they're caring for is failure to thrive, which is a you know an infant thing, vomiting, bleeding, rash, and infections. So again, just to raise awareness, if you have patients who are talking about the following mixture of things, it's a it's a yellow flag. So apnea feeding problems, diarrhea, seizures, blue skin, asthma, allergies, fevers, vomiting, failure to thrive, bleeding, rash, and infections. The, the reason why these ones are the most common is, in theory, because they're, they're easy to fake. It's, it's hard to fake a, you know, it's hard to fake cancer, for instance, right? You can't say, my kid has cancer, and then they do tests and they're like, uh, no, your kid does not have cancer. But it's easy to fake diarrhea, for instance, right? Because if you're taking care of your two-year-old child and your child, you, you can call the doctor and say, say my, my child has had diarrhea for the past 10 days. And there's the usually doctors will just believe that, right? So you can just fake that. Or you can call your doctor and say, my child has blue skin or my child had a seizure, my child had something that seemed like a seizure or something. It's easy to fake that because there's no way for the doctor to run a test to make sure that you're telling the truth. Um, apnea, these kind of allergies, fevers is, you know, fever would be really easy, right? You just, you call the physician and you say, uh, my child has had a temperature of 106 for the past 10 hours. What should I do? You know, the physician says, Oh my God, bring the child to the ER. And then you come to the ER and, and you tell them what you've been seeing. And, and you know, they're going to, they're going to jump to attention on that. And cause what's the chance that the parent is lying, right? So, but some are, and that's how these people get away with it is it's such a rare thing for a parent to be this, this abusive and uh, this abusive in this way. All right, so let's talk about the usual presentation of Munchausen by proxy or factitious disorder, um, <laughs> factitious disorder imposed by another. That's the DSM-5. Okay, so common uh, presentations. Studies show that the perpetrator is more commonly female and generally is the mother of the victim. Men have been perpetrators, according to research, about 7% of the time. So out of everyone who commits Munchausen by proxy, 7% of them are men and 93% uh, are women. And uh, generally it's the mother of the child. The victims, the children are usually under the age of five. So that's important. I think the average was like four years old or three or something. Char characteristics of the perpetrator. 
they are often self-sacrificing. You know, they're like a, a martyr. You know, they will say, I've been staying up all night with my child or I'll sleep in the hospital with my child. They will appear very devoted to their children. They are also highly supportive of the physicians. So they, they might be very nice and complimentary to the physician, which is actually another kind of red flag if you're a physician out there. If you, if you have a, a parent, of a child and they are being extremely complimentary to you. It's, it's a, it's a yellow flag for, for this sort of thing. Not to say that parents should never compliment their, their, you know, children's physicians, but it's just a yellow flag, you know, and usually physicians who have enough experience will know the difference. They'll, they'll know the difference between someone who's being normally complimentary and someone who's being overly complimentary. There are other things that could be besides Munchausen by proxy. They could just be anxious or they could have a personality disorder. But anyway, other characteristics of the perpetrator is they are very knowledgeable about medical things. And they are also very fascinated with medical things for obvious reasons. They often will interfere with treatment. They will sort of get their, you know, they'll butt in into treatment and sort of get in the way of things. Sometimes they are extremely open to very invasive behaviors. If I was a physician and I had a, and I, you know, had a question mark about whether or not I had a parent who had Munchausen by proxy, I would suggest a very invasive procedure (laughs) and just see what the reaction would be from the parent. Because, you know, the vast majority, if you say, well, you know, I think there's about a, a 3% chance that if we do open heart surgery, that that might help. You know, if you say something like that, and if you have, you know, most people would be like, what, what, what open heart surgery? No, like 3% chance of that working. No, that's, that's, you know, it's not worth it. Open heart surgery. That's terrible. Um, whether or not it's true, open heart surgery is bad or not. Most people I would surmise would be pretty scared of that. Uh, you know, if it's your two, three year old child, but, uh, but a parent who has Munchausen by proxy will be like, will be gleeful about it. They'll be like, Ooh, oh, tell me more. Yeah, I think that's a good, let's do that. I think it's a good option. Now, you know, I'm generalizing here, but it's one way you can uh, maybe as a litmus test. People who are perpetrators often appear to be very calm in the face of serious difficulties in their child's medical situation. So again, most, if you, if you said something like, I think your child has a, a heart condition that is potentially life-threatening, most parents will just faint right there in your office, right? They're just, they're not going to take it well. They're, they're going to be very upset. They're going to have a wide variety of, of emotional reactions. And however, if you have Munchausen by proxy, then you'll, you'll appear very calm. You'll just be like, huh, okay, well tell me more because the, the Munchausen by proxy person, this is, this is music to their ears. It's not terrifying at all to them. Really. This is why they're there is for that kind of thing. It's what they're thinking is, well, if my child has a heart condition, then, then I will get even more benefits from, you know, all this, all this machinations, you know, anyway. Um, it's also another characteristic of the perpetrator is someone who enjoys the hospital because most people don't enjoy the hospital. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I walk into a hospital, particularly like particular wings of a hospital. I'm just like, yeesh, get me out of here. Well, someone with Munchausen by proxy or Munchausen for that matter, fictitious disorder, they will be very comfortable in a hospital and, and it won't freak them out because that's where they get all the good stuff. Okay. Another usual presentation detail is the caregiver usually manipulate, manipulates the situation to make them look like the best caregiver in the world. You know, look at that mother. She loves her daughter so much. She's so brave is, is kind of the thing. So they usually manipulate everyone around them to, to see them in that way. And in the documentary, you definitely see that, as I'll talk about in a second. What are the causes of factitious disorder imposed on another or uh, Munchausen by proxy. Well, 
it's hard to say because it's hard to nail this down and many people don't even think it's an actual uh, disorder, but there seems to be an association with the obvious things like child abuse from their own caregivers or emotional neglect or specifically growing up in a family that only gave you attention if you were sick or if you were taking care of someone who was sick. So if you're a young girl and your family is falling apart and your father, you know, abandons you and your mother is extremely depressed, we're talking like off the charts depressed and your siblings are just sort of staying away from the house and you're left alone and no one is paying attention to you and you're scared and you're alone and you don't know what else to do, what else to do. And over time you learn that when you take care of your mother, that people give you love and a little bit of love and attention. You know, the, the father comes back around every once in a while and says, Oh, I'm, it's so great that you're taking care of your, of your mom. So that's one element. Another element is when you make it known that your mother is in, is in dire straits, then, and people come running, then you solidify that behavior in, in your, in your brain. So for instance, if you are, you know, you just kind of look at your mom, you're saying, well, you know, she's depressed and she's in bed all day. She, I don't think she's going to try to uh, kill herself, but the last time she was suicidal and I told everyone, everyone came running because everyone didn't want her to die. So I wonder what would happen if I told everyone that she told me that she was going to kill herself, even though she didn't. And I wonder if everyone will come running. And let's say, you know, this young girl does that and, you know, she, she calls the authorities and she calls her biological father and she calls her aunts and uncles and she says, mommy said that she's going to kill herself and I don't know what to do. And then everyone comes running. Well, what do you think that teaches that child? What it teaches them is the only way they can gain love and attention is if they are taking care of someone who is in grave danger. And so the grandparents and the 911 people and the biological father, they come running and they, and they say to her, you're doing such a great job. If you hadn't told us that your mom was going to kill herself, she might be dead right now. You're such a brave little girl. You're so good. So you're getting all of that attention. And you learn that the only way that anyone will love you, because deep down you believe you're not lovable, the only way anyone will love you is if you have someone in your life who is ill and who needs to be, needs to be taken care of, and you are that brave person taking care of them. Well, you grow up and you try to find people to take care of. And if you have problems getting a job in a legitimate way, taking care of people, one of the easy routes to, and, and, and if you have psychopathic tendencies as a result of neglect, then all you need to do is have a child, which is a process, obviously, but, it, but it's not a hard, th you know, you don't have to pass a, a licensing exam to have kids. And so you get pregnant and you have a kid and then all you have to do is just lie and say that your child has symptoms and suddenly you're, you're in the sweet place where you're taking care of someone who needs help and everyone is running to you and paying attention to you and you're getting all that love and attention that you don't think you can get otherwise. That's the key thing is that people with Munchausen by proxy have both psychopathic tendencies in that they don't have empathy for other people, obviously, and they don't believe that they will get any attention through legitimate means because of the way they were raised. Okay, so I wanna talk about famous cases, but before we do that, let's take a break. <music> Okay, we're back from the break. A couple little things you can do if you like the podcast. You can join the Facebook fan group. That's the fan. We have two different Facebook pages, but one's the fan group, and that one is not run by me. It's run by a famous patron, Lyndon. More people are starting to uh, participate on the fan group. Fun stuff. People are posting stuff. Kind of fun. 
Also, uh, become a patron of the podcast. Do that. Go to patreon.com. When you become a patron of the podcast, you get access to all of our premium episodes. We have hundreds of them in which we do deep dives on all sorts of stuff. So become a patron of the podcast. Do it now. Also, if you become a $20 patron, you'll get one of our awesome mugs. And I have to say, these, these Psychology in Seattle mugs are the best ever. They have the best handle. They're the best shape. I, I narcissistically use my Psychology in Seattle mug every day. Every morning I get up and I pour myself a copy, coffee. Uh, the one day I don't use the cup is when I have clients, I have, I have a home office, and when one of my clients and supervisees and supervisors of supervisees are coming to my office, I don't want to be seen walking around with a mug that has my face on it. <laughs> so I use a different mug. But um, every once in a while I forget and, I, and I'm talking to a client. I look over at my table and I'm like, oh my God, my Psychology in Seattle mug is there with, with pictures of my face and Umberto's face. And this is, this is embarrassing. Anyway, it's a great mug for coffee. And it you know has various different pictures and different things on there. It's it's a collage, if you will. So okay, famous cases. This is all from Wikipedia, by the way. Lisa Hayden Johnson was jailed for three years after subjecting her son to a total of three hundred three hundred and twenty five medical actions, including being confined to a wheelchair and being fed through a tube in his stomach. Uh, this is very weird because in the documentary, this is exactly the same thing that Dee Dee did to uh, Gypsy, uh, which we'll get into more in a second. But uh, confining a child to a wheelchair and then uh, making uh, the child get a uh, a tube into the stomach that goes through the abdomen. You know, it's a tube that goes directly into your stomach, you know, through your through your belly. Right. And, um, you know, that was one of the 325 medical actions that Lisa Hayden Johnson uh, did to her child. And she was jailed for three years, convicted. She claimed her son suffered from a long list of illnesses, including diabetes, food allergies, cerebral palsy, and cystic fibrosis. She, re she received numerous cash donations and charity gifts, including two cruises. Another famous case from Wikipedia, uh, 2014, Lacey Spears was charged with second degree depraved murder, second degree depraved murder, second degree depraved. This must, that must not be a, an American. It doesn't sound American. <laughs> depraved murder, um, second degree depraved murder and first degree manslaughter. She allegedly fed her son dangerous amounts of salt after she conducted research on the internet about its effects. Her actions were allegedly motivated by the social media attention she gained on Facebook and Twitter. She was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. So because she was getting attention on Facebook and Twitter, she decided to poison her son with salt. And her child ended up dying, and then she is sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Okay, so the documentary... Uh, Mommy, Dead, and Dearest. I just watched it. It's a great documentary. Very effective. Very creepy. But not sensational, though. It's, it's one of the least sensational documentaries I've seen in a while. Because, you know, one of the ways you make a documentary entertaining is, is to make it very sensational with lots of, you know, dun -dun, you know, all these kinds of bells and whistles to make things look more ominous than they actually are. But the director, Aaron Lee Carr... She just kind of kept it to the facts and she just, she just showed you the interviews and she just showed you what was actually happening because this, the story is so compelling anyway. It doesn't need any bells and whistles. It's so creepy anyway. It doesn't need to be creepified at all. Okay, so the two main people here are Dee Dee, who is the mother. Her name is Dee Dee. Uh, her real name was something else, but I'm just going to refer to it as Dee Dee. And her daughter, Gypsy Rose. So we have Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose, the daughter. Dee Dee is the one who has Munchausen by proxy or factitious disorder uh, induced on another. <laughs> Wait, what? Factitious disorder imposed on another. It's such a weird name. But I'm just going to call it Munchausen by proxy because it's easier to say. So Dee Dee has Munchausen by proxy. And in interviews with Dee Dee's father and stepmother and nephew, 
they all reveal the following things about Didi. Didi is from uh, the bayou in Louisiana, and everyone has, I think, what they call some sort of bayou accent, Cajun accent of some kind. Anyway, uh, people in her family said that she always got her way and that she would make people pay if she didn't get what she wanted, even when she was a young, young kid. So from an early age, she always had some kind of psychopathic tendency. She took out credit cards in her family members' names. She wrote bad checks. She committed a lot of crimes in this way in terms of money crimes, you know, fraud crimes. She also, there were, there was, there was talk that she had been poisoning her stepmother, I think, uh, maybe her mother. I can't remember. I think maybe it was her stepmother. Anyway, she was poisoning someone in her family with Roundup, you know, the Roundup that you put in plants. And the woman was left bedridden for nine months because of this poisoning. And the family member said she always got away with these things. She never got, she never was really caught. They also said that her mother, her biological mother was like Dee Dee. So her, her biological mother has since passed away, but the family was saying that Dee Dee's mother was a shoplifter and she would steal people's clothes from the laundromat. She stole money from family and she probably did other sorts of things. And so this is, probably a case in which we have both a biological component for psychopathy and an environmental component, meaning that Dee Dee was raised by a psychopathic mother and learned how that psychopathy was the way to get things done. You know, it, when you are not given empathy, if, if you, when I mean by psychopathic, the main characteristic I'm talking about here is lack of empathy. And so if you don't have empathy for other human beings and you are raising a child, then your child will not get the proper attachment needs met that will build the neurological building blocks for you to have empathy for other people. And the cycle just continues. So it's, it's environmental for sure, but it also might have a biological component in that some people might be biologically predisposed to a lack of empathy. It's hard to tease those out all the time. You need twin studies and adoption studies, but anyway. So Dee Dee's mother had issues with crime and with uh, psychopathy and antisocial behavior. Also, the, the family was looking back and saying that Dee Dee might have even killed her own mother by starving her, which is, so I'm going to spoil the documentary. Again, you really just have to watch the documentary. Uh, but even if the doc, if, even if I do spoil it, I'm guessing it's not, it's not going to ruin it because the documentary is just so interesting. Um, plus the things I'm about to tell you, I think they reveal in the very first scene of the documentary. So Gypsy, so we have... We have Dee, Dee, Dee Dee's mother, who was a shoplifter and would steal money from family and this sort of thing. Then we have Dee Dee, who, had, who obviously had Munchausen by proxy and also uh, would, uh, you know, was, had fraud tendencies like her mother. But then Dee Dee had a child, Gypsy Rose, this, this girl, and she um, would fake a lot of illnesses in Gypsy Rose. Well, Dee Dee... Uh, what might have killed her own mother by starving her mother, maybe because Dee Dee had a bone to pick with her mother because her mother might have abused her. Unknown, but it seems likely that Dee Dee's mother was not the best. Um, and then, in a, an, if that's true, then how poetic or you know darkly poetic it is that Gypsy Rose, Dee Dee's daughter, ends up killing her as well. So we have like two generations of killing your mothers, essentially, which is fascinating. Also, in the interviews in the documentary with the family members, they they think that she got what she deserved. You know, they're they're saying so. You know, Dee Dee was killed by her her daughter's boyfriend and at the behest of her daughter. Basically, her daughter killed her. And so, you know, what do you think about that? And they asked this question to Dee Dee's father. They asked Dee Dee's father, do you think your daughter got what she deserved by being murdered by your granddaughter? And he's like, yep, got what, got what she deserved. And then they're talking about how uh, Dee Dee's ashes was sent, 
with you know, people are trying to send Dee Dee's ashes around and no one wanted it. And people are saying, ah, just flush it down the toilet and stuff. Now, when you watch it, it seems really just, you know, mean. Because even though Dee Dee is a legitimate monster, <laughs> I mean, once I tell you everything that Dee Dee did, you're just like, well, I could see how the family wouldn't necessarily be all too caring about the fact that Dee Dee was murdered. So when you're watching it, you're, you're, you're like, well, geez, they're being pretty harsh. Um, so it could mean a couple things. It could mean one that Dee Dee was such a monster. And if you've ever lived with, with one of these kinds of people, even for, a, you know, a short amount of time, you understand that your hatred for these kinds of people can run very deep and the lack of compassion that you can have for these people can be very uh, pronounced. Um, so it could, so it could be just a result. So the, the family members sort of uh, callousness could just be a result of, of that, or it could be an indication that many people in this family lack empathy for other people. And all of that played a role in DD's development. Hard to tell, but anyway, Okay, so the other character, not character, but, you know, human being that is in this documentary is Gypsy Rose. So I'm just going to give you uh, the various different medical claims that Dee Dee had, Gypsy Rose's mother, about Gypsy Rose from a very early age. At the age of six months, when Gypsy Rose was just six months old, Dee Dee was already making stuff up. Uh, sleep apnea, again, remember from the most, that's the most common Munchausen by proxy uh, claim is my child has apnea. And she even got the three-year-old on a, on a breathing machine of some sort, which is crazy. And she ended up having this breathing machine, this, you know, I don't know what you call those things. What do you call those things? Respirator kind of things that you wear while you're sleeping. She Gypsy Rose had to sleep with that thing on for years and years, like into her childhood, you know, into her teenagers. Other medical cl claims, I'm just going to rattle them off. Problem with her eyes. Uh, you know, my daughter has problems which she can't see. My daughter has problems with her hearing. My daughter has problems with her GI system. She has GI reflux. Now, remember, there, none of these things are likely to actually have been happening. So, so just keep that in mind that she, she not only made these claims, but she got treatment for all these things. GI reflux, anemia, anemia. It's like, okay. Hypoventilation, allergies, incontinence, lung disease, heart murmur. Uh, she, uh, multiple sclerosis to the point where she confined her daughter to a wheelchair and I say confined her daughter because her daughter could walk and knew she could walk, but she basically abused her daughter into faking like she couldn't walk. And she was in a wheelchair for a long time, you know, cause there's nothing more obviously my, you know, there's, there's nothing more obvious as a signal that my child has problems than having a child in a wheelchair. Right. Cause if your child has, you know, acid reflux, you can't wear that around like a badge, but, if your child can't walk and he's a wheelchair, then you put your child on a wheelchair and suddenly everyone is looking at you as the mother of like, Oh, you're so brave. Right. So now this isn't to discount actual bravery and courage and uh, dedication that actual mothers have for actual kids who have actual disabilities and medical problems. So I just want to be clear about that. Uh, but these, uh, people like Dee Dee with Munchausen by, pro by proxy, they prey on that cultural attention that, that we give people. Um, Dee Dee also claimed that her daughter was developmentally disabled, even though she was not. She claimed that her daughter had a chromosome disorder that was causing all sorts of problems. She claimed her daughter had leukemia. She made it so that her daughter needed to be fed through a tube. In her, she, so they... Every six months, they had to renew this this uh, tube that went through her stomach into her into her uh, you know gut, and uh, just think about that. You know, you're this child with this unnecessary tube running through your abdomen into your stomach. It's just terrible. She claimed that her daughter had asthma, epilepsy, 
Um, she claimed that her daughter's legs were paralyzed. She even uh, had several different dates of birth to the point where uh, Gypsy Rose didn't even know how old she was because if she kept Gypsy young, then one, that would make Gypsy more dependent, but it also uh, kept uh, doctors paying more attention to her because the younger your child, presumably the more attention you get when your child is suffering in some way. They showed a picture in the documentary of this closet that was full of medications. I mean, one whole closet just full of Gypsy's medications. It's crazy. Also, because of the feeding tube, she talks about this in the documentary, Gypsy says that she didn't even have to be awake for her mom to put whatever she wanted to into her body. So Gypsy might be asleep, and her mother would, would just, you know, put stuff into her stomach, including, you know, all sorts of medication and possibly even poisons, right, to, to make it so that Gypsy would have more symptoms that would cause more medical concerns, right? And also, uh, looking back, it, it seems that when you look at the medical records, it seems that all of the various different procedures and medications that were being prescribed, by the way, and given to Gypsy, were causing all these various side effects that seemed that made it seem as though Gypsy had actual medical issues that needed treatment, and so they would pile on even more treatments. You know, you uh, somehow. Uh, uh, Dee Dee would convince a physician that uh, Gypsy had some disorder. And, like, and then she's like, okay, I'm going to give you this medication. And then that medication would cause some sort of symptom. And then Dee Dee would take Gypsy to another physician and say, this, my child has this thing. And then the physician would say, oh, well, I'll, let's treat it with this, this, with this medication. And then you just sort of work your way around the physicians long enough. And before you know it, you have... 20 different medications pulling this child in all these different directions, giving the child all these side effects. And then it's hard to determine what's being caused by medication and what isn't. For instance, all, a lot of her teeth fell out because of the medications she was taking, which caused her to have to go to the dentist a lot, right? <laughs> she had been to the hospital over a hundred times within the span of nine years from 05 to 14. She had many surgeries many, many surgeries for uh, on her stomach, on her eyes. She had a surgery on her eyes. She had a uh, surgery to remove her salivary glands. I mean, I just like, why did that happen? And a gypsy thought that everything was real. The only thing she thought was fake was the fact that she couldn't walk because she knew she, she could walk. But gypsy grew up from the time she was three months old having her mother seem like her mother loved her and seem like her mother knew what was best. And so Gypsy, and because Dee Dee kept Gypsy in this super dependent childlike state and, and Gypsy was never taught how to think for herself, Gypsy just thought, well, I, I guess I have all these disorders. Um, incidentally, uh, Dee Dee also would make claims that they were Katrina survivors, um, which I don't think they were. Okay. Now, we have to watch this documentary because it's so interesting to see because there's a lot of video of Dee Dee and Gypsy together prior to, you know, recent events. They are at different benefits. You know, one of the things that different charities will do is they will ask one of the beneficiaries of the charity to come to a luncheon or a, or a fundraising activity and give a testimonial. Right. So if a charity gave money to Dee Dee and, and Gypsy and they benefited from it, then they might ask Gypsy and Charity or Gypsy, <laughs> Gypsy and Charity, Gypsy and Dee Dee to come to a charity luncheon to talk about how the charity benefited them so that other people will donate more money, essentially. Right. And so there's a lot of these little videos in which. Uh, ch uh, not charity, no, some charity in which uh, Gypsy is being carted off on stage, or she's being, or she's posing with different, you know, charity people, and and uh, it's 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 just really interesting. But you can also see that it seems as though Gypsy felt very close to her mother. They, uh, it almost seemed like. Gypsy felt in a certain way kind of very loved by her mother because her mother gave her so much attention. 
So anyway, another thing you notice is how childish Gypsy comes across. I won't go into all the details, but when you watch it, you just, you really see how Gypsy was made to act very young. So even though she would, she would be like 15 or 18 years old, she, if you heard her voice, it sounded like she was four, like literally she, you know, she, she would be this grown teenage girl and talking in this three-year-old high voice. And uh, this is, you know, because Dee Dee forced her and socialized her to act like a very young child. In in other words, when when uh, Gypsy would act older, Dee Dee would punish her or would ignore her or something, you know. And so uh, that's very pronounced, uh, almost hard to watch, almost hard to listen to. Actually, as a listener, it's just like, man, her voice is so high and so shrill. This is common to abused children. Uh, one of the defenses that abused children will engage in is to act as though they're very young because uh, the abuser, some, the perpetrator of abuse will sometimes go easier on a, on a child if, if the child seems very dependent and needy and young. Um, also, Gypsy didn't appear to know how old she was, as I was saying, because Dee Dee wouldn't let her know. Uh, for instance, the father, so, so the father of, of Gypsy, who was only briefly married to Dee Dee, had occasional contact with, with her daughter Gypsy. And a lot of the documentary focuses on him and on him talking about how guilty he felt. But anyway, there's this part in the documentary in which the father is saying, yeah, so I called, I called my daughter Gypsy on her birthday, on her 18th birthday, and Dee Dee told me to not tell Gypsy that she's 18. Uh, so, so Dee Dee controlled everything, right? She, I mean, imagine the amount of things you'd have to control. She was homeschooled, by the way, after like second grade or something. Imagine the things you would have to control in a child's life so that the child doesn't even know how old they are. You, know, you would have to isolate that child from so many different people. So, so that's another thing that they, they portray, I think, kind of well in, in the documentary, showing how controlling Dee Dee was, how so all-encompassing Dee Dee was in Gypsy's life. I mean, she made, she, Dee Dee made Gypsy into someone who couldn't even walk, who needed to be pushed around in a chair so that Gypsy wasn't able to escape or wasn't able to walk up to someone uh, or walk away from Dee Dee. Uh, it was just, you just get this sense that um, Dee Dee was very, very systematic in terms of her controlling her. There were accounts that she would beat her, she would beat her daughter hard whenever they were talking to other people, because they have, again, they have all these interviews talking about how Gypsy was surviving cancer and surviving all these different things in the media and stuff. And so there's all this footage of these interviews and Dee Dee is always holding on to her when they were talking to other people. And Gypsy would say that when Gypsy would step out of line while being interviewed by the media, Dee Dee, the mother, would squeeze her hand, you know, she's to indicate you're, you know, you're stepping out of line here, and that would give Gypsy knowledge that she, oh, I better step back in line, or else I'm, I'm going to pay the price about this. Interestingly, when uh, Gypsy was a little older, maybe I don't know, twenty years old or something, she actually got out of the house. She escaped, and Dee Dee quickly found her and brought her back home and broke her laptop and her phone with a hammer and said that if you, if you escape again, I'm going to break your hands. And, you know, I'm sure she didn't use the word escape. She was probably just, you know, saying, if you ever break my rules again, I'm going to break your hands or something. And so it's interesting that at one point, Gypsy actually did manage to escape this prison. 
when uh, there were allegations of child abuse and CPS would be called and, and police would be called and they would go to the house. And when they come to the house to investigate these things, Dee Dee would figure out a way to manipulate them and they would just go away. Um, also, you know, uh, they talk about a little bit about this in the documentary, but I, and I wish they went into more detail, but there were a number of benefits that Dee Dee had from this Munchausen by proxy. They had a free house that was built just for them by Habitat for Humanity. They were given a lot of funds by charity. They were given donations from people online, you know, because Dee Dee or someone helping out the family made a website and you could make, give donations. And uh, they also got attention from the media and they got attention from the community, good attention, you know, just all this, you know, just, just think about when a child is suffering from cancer and the mother is struggling and you have, you know, so you have a, what's perceived as a single mother with a child that's suffering from all these different medical problems. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a feel good story. You, you see these kinds of stories, uh, you know, um, Russell Wilson of the Seahawks will go to the hospital and pose with these families and, and will talk with them. And there's just uh, not to say that having cancer or having a child suffering from cancer is this wonderful life. It's, it's horrific. I, I know that from talking with people about it, but you do get some benefits, which is you get free stuff. You get a famous people might say hi to you. Um, there was a famous case of Munchausen by proxy, which Hillary Clinton actually visited the family uh, during the nineties, I think. And then it later came out that the child didn't have any kind of actual problems that it was actually Munchausen by proxy. And so, so yeah, they got a lot of attention that way. They got to spend a lot of time in Disneyland because of, uh, you know, playing up the illnesses and they got a lot of help from social workers and stuff. Okay. So the documentary, the main focus uh, is Munchausen by proxy, but the other focus is that, um, is that Dee Dee is murdered by by Gypsy and Gypsy's boyfriend. I mean, specifically Gypsy's boyfriend is the one who take who carries out the actual murder. But but Gypsy asked her boyfriend to kill her mother. So this was recently, I think like 2014, 2015 or something. So now let's talk about our third person is Nicholas. Nicholas is Gypsy's boyfriend. They met on a Christian dating site probably because she couldn't meet people in real life. His parents said, Nicholas's parents said, so they interview them uh, in the police. You know, they, they show a lot of police interviews, which is just chilling to see. But the parents said that Nicholas was a loner and that, that everyone uh, hurt his feelings. He was very sensitive and he was also developmentally delayed in some way. Throughout the uh, documentary, you learn that he has BD, he's into BDSM and that he was arrested for masturbating at work for nine hours, I think is one of the things they, they found that he was, he was fired from his job at McDonald's because I, I don't remember this exactly, but I think they said he was masturbating at work for nine hours and he was fired. He says uh, in the police interview that he has dissociative identity disorder or multiple personalities and he also hears voices in his head. It's hard to, it's hard to believe these accounts, you know, when someone is being accused of murder that they'll say a lot of things, right? But, but really from, from both of their accounts, I think it's possible from both, you know, Gypsy talks about Nicholas's mental condition and Nicholas talks about his own in these police interviews. And I think it's possible the way that he talks about it, um, you know, Nicholas might have experienced a fair amount of abuse himself and uh, seems to be exhibiting adult indications of, of early abuse, which could result in dissociative identity disorder. It's just hard to tell, especially now that the murder has occurred because Nicholas has reasons to claim that he has mental illness, right? So Nicholas and, and uh, Gypsy, they meet on this Christian dating site and they start, you know, communicating over the internet all the time. In fact, that's where most of their contact is because they can't see each other because, because Dee Dee won't let Gypsy out of the house. So they're, they're communicating online a lot. 
And one of the th- interesting things about this documentary is somehow they got their hands on a lot of the communication between Gypsy and and Nicholas, like really explicit <laughs> details, like even their sexting and stuff. And I don't know if they just gave up that stuff to help, you know, sort of exonerate them. Or I don't know. But anyway, they were together for a year. And then at a certain point, Gypsy confides in Nicholas and says that her mother is very controlling and she doesn't know how to get away from her mother. And in, uh, when Nicholas and Gypsy are detained by the police, eventually they actually admit that, that they... Uh, that they in fact did kill um, uh, uh, Dee Dee, the gypsy's mom. Um, they they have different kind of messenger messenger chat between them. Like there's this one chat between them the the day that they were actually going to kill the mother. Gypsy says, "This shit's gonna go down tonight." Nicholas replies, "Babe, it's my evil." S- Sorry, babe, it's my evil side doing it. He won't mess up because he enjoys killing. Gypsy says, we'll be happy soon. After this night, we will never bring it up again. So these these texts back and forth are super creepy and chilling. I mean, the callousness and the 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 way they talk about it, you know, it's it'd be one thing if Gypsy was like, I'm really afraid. I don't know what to do. I, I don't really see any other way. I don't want to kill my mom, but I, I feel like if I don't, she'll find me. You know, there's just, there's nothing like that that they present in a documentary anyway. It's all just this sort of weird internet kind of troll talk. Or, <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it's crazy. And, and another one, Nick is, uh, saying that he wants to rape his the mom. N- Nicholas is saying, okay, I'm going to come over there, I'm going to kill your mom, and I'm going to rape her. And then Gypsy made a deal with Nicholas and said, don't rape my mom because I, I just want you to kill her, but don't rape her. But if you need to rape someone, you can rape me instead, which is what they did. So Nicholas came over to the house. He, had to, he lived across the country, I think, and had... He came to the house and she, uh, uh, Gypsy let Nicholas in and then Nicholas went into the bedroom and killed the mother with a knife. And then, and then Nicholas quote unquote raped Gypsy right after that while they were in the house. I mean, do you know what I mean? This story is just completely nuts. Anyway, so before I move forward, let's take a break. Okay, we're back. So uh, another uh, kind of really creepy Facebook situation here is as soon as Gypsy let in Nicholas and then Nicholas went into the bedroom and killed Dee Dee, uh, Gypsy's mother, Gypsy went on Facebook and posted the following things. She, she said, the bitch is dead. I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet, innocent daughter. Her scream was so fucking loud, LOL. So they show this on Facebook. And I just find, you know, the the way that you can make documentaries today is just so interesting because people who commit these kinds of crimes now will often leave behind these these online uh, moments, you know, these these. Because this happened, uh, Gypsy posted this on the internet like right after it happened. And it's just so like, what? And, and people are, are watching, you know, are hear, you know, reading these posts on Facebook and they're replying as Gypsy is posting them. And so again, the bitch is dead. I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet, innocent daughter. So, so Gypsy is saying that herself. And all these other people are like, what's going on here? Is your account hacked or what's, what's happening? So Gypsy and Nicholas are both charged with first degree murder as they should be. And they are, fa- they were facing life or death, you know, death penalty. But once the police and the prosecutors started to investigate what was happening, they were like, wait a second here. This isn't just a case in which we have, 
just this random killing of this mother. We, we have a situation in which Dee Dee, the mother, had been systematically abusing this daughter for her entire life. And, you know, that's what we call a mitigating factor, meaning it doesn't, it doesn't justify the murder, but it provides a context for why it might have occurred and maybe justification for not having as harsh of a sentence. A psychologist is interviewed in the, in the documentary saying that uh, she was like a hostage and in a way, the psychologist doesn't say this directly, but he's basically saying that Gypsy had reasons, justifiable reasons maybe, maybe for killing her mother. And also there's a lot of talk about how Gypsy might have not known what reality was because when you're fed just lies after lies after lies, and the world is all buying the lies and you've been fed this weird reality your entire life, you might not know what's up and what's down. And you're also made to be very dependent and, and, and very childish. And so can someone like Gypsy in that situation be held accountable for her actions? It's, it's just hard to, hard to tell. Oh, by the way, before you watch this documentary, it, <laughs> I mean, I already told you you should be watching it, but if you haven't watched it or you haven't gotten all the way through it yet, uh, you should be careful because there's this one scene toward the end in which they show crime photos of the mother and her knife wounds in her back. And it's, it's pretty brutal. And so I, if you're not cool with that kind of stuff, I would skip over it. So in the end, Gypsy was convicted of, of a crime and, and sentenced to 10 years in prison, eligible for parole at eight and a half years. Her lawyer was very happy with this since she was facing life or the death penalty. And Gypsy feels really good about it. She, she is one of the most positive people on the planet, I just have to say. Um, but she, when asked, you know, how do you feel about being uh, sent to prison for 10 years over this? She's like, well, being in jail is better than being with my mom. So... Uh, I'll take being in jail, you know, if, if she doesn't say this directly, but in essence, she's saying, I don't see any other way I could have gotten away from my mom. Cause my mom would have either tracked me down or done something. And I needed to maybe kill her in order to get away from her. And I, uh, if that means I have to go to jail for 10 years, then that's a price worth, I'm, you know, worth paying. Now, she didn't say that directly, but I was, you know, kind of reading into it. Um, and, you know, after watching this documentary, I believe that jail is probably a better place than living with her mom or under her mom's thumb. Now, Nicholas, on the other hand, his trial is next month from the time I'm recording this. In his, his, his trial is in June of 2017. And he might get life in prison, which is interesting, right? Because... Well, he was the one who actually committed the murder, so it kind of makes sense. But he w he only did it because, presumably, because Gypsy asked him to do it, and he was trying to he was trying to help her. And so, it's interesting that Nicholas could actually go to prison for life, but Gypsy would only go to prison for eight to ten years. But it does actually kind of make sense because when you watch this documentary, you get the sense that Nicholas there's something really different about him. You know, the fact that he was so gung ho about killing someone, the fact that he didn't think this through at all, the fact that he has lots of different kinds of problems along these lines. He, uh, you know, wanted to rape the, the mother and kill her. I mean, this isn't just some innocent kid who got wrapped up in something, you know, there, there's something definitely off about this guy. And I worry about this guy being on the streets, honestly. So, but on the other hand, would he have, you know, there are people who have a sort of openness, shall we say to psychopathic behavior, but never do it because there's never really a point to it. And so, uh, you know, in fact, most psychopaths never do anything like this. So, the fact that he's off in some ways doesn't mean that he is you know, automatically going to commit a bunch more crimes. But anyway, watch the documentary more for that sort of thing. So um, in conclusion, let's, let's ask some questions. 
I, th- one of the biggest questions that I think is being asked after watching this documentary is, are the doctors and the physicians and the hospitals, are they, are they responsible for what was happening here? And I think it's a very legitimate question. In the documentary, they lay out that many physicians had suspicions that Dee Dee had Munchausen by proxy and that the all the claims of physical problems for uh, Gypsy were just made up by the mother. There were many physicians who had questions, some of, some of which had extreme suspicions, some of which actually said she has Munchausen by proxy. <laughs> and yet no, nothing happened. There's, when they flip through a, a lot of these assessments, there's a majority or some massive amount of medical data that they relied upon was all according to the mother this and mother reported that and that sort of thing instead of physicians actually doing their own assessments, they would just take the account of the mother and run with it. So that's, you know, problem number one. But again, as I, I, I think I said earlier, for most parents, they don't lie about that kind of stuff. And so reports from parents can be uh, believed. Also, a lot of times physicians don't have time or money to conduct a bunch of tests or t- tests don't exist to, to test for certain things. And so a lot of times, uh, particularly with kids who can't talk, you have to rely on parents in terms of their account about things. So, you know, but having said that, it seems like if we're going to look on a micro level at various different points in Gypsy's life, we could probably see a number of points where physicians should have not taken the mother's account as gospel. Also, in the documentary, there's one particular physician who they interview who had significant suspicions about Munchausen by proxy with regards to this case. And he said he had doubts from the beginning. And he said that he knew that she could even walk. So this physician is like, uh, I know this child can walk, and yet, the child is in a wheelchair. You know, what's going on here? And he reached out to other clinicians, uh, past clinicians. And one of the past clinicians said that Gypsy doesn't even have MS. Also in the documentary, this physician said that he didn't see any point in confronting her because there were so many other clinicians who were totally convinced. And this is, you know, when you're watching this part of the documentary, it, it, you just want to pull your hair out because there are so many different points where someone could have done something and no one did anything. Particularly this one physician who actually like had major questions and had basically concluded that Dee Dee had Munchausen by proxy and that, that uh, Gypsy didn't actually suffer from some, if not any of these disorders that were in, on record. And this physician even thought about uh, doing something about it and yet did nothing. Be, you know, I think p- because the way he was saying it, it was like, well, there were all these other clinicians involved and there were like communities of people involved. And if I called this out, uh, how many people would have believed me? I, I don't know if many people would have believed me. And I just find that to be incredibly frustrating, which I can understand, by the way. You know, if you're a physician and you're looking at a case and you're like, I'm 80% sure that this mother is lying and that, that there's all sorts of problems here, but I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure something's up here. And then you look around and you see that everyone is just gobbling it up. And not only are they gobbling it up, but they're actually rewarding, you know, they're heavily involved in just congratulating this mother on how great of a mother she is. The, the amount of uh, fallout in your life as a physician that will happen if you, if you confront this woman, it, it's, it's really great. You know? You're predicting, it's like, okay, I'm going to go to the mother, I'm going I'm to start doing these tests, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to the mother, I think you're lying. In fact, there's kind of a trail that indicates that you're actually making this stuff up. Well, who knows what the mother would do at that point, right? Would she get violent? 
which he, I mean, someone who would do this amount of manipulation, are they capable of paying someone to kill you? You know, it's possible. Or, or finding some way of killing you herself, you know, poisoning your food somehow. So there's that kind of worry, which I think is totally legitimate. And then there's the worry that she could sue you as a physician, right? There's also the worry that you could be labeled by the medical community as someone who doesn't have any compassion. I mean, you know, this, this family was seen as this, you know, this gypsy was seen as this, you know, adorable uh, suffering child, which she was, but even in reality, but, but they thought she was suffering from all these medical conditions that she didn't have. And then you come out and you call everyone a faker, including the child, by the way. You're, you're, you, part of your accusation is not toward the mother, but you're actually accusing the child of faking that they can't walk. Imagine that one, right? It's like walking up to someone in a wheelchair and, and saying, you can walk, I know you can, and then you know, trying to dump them out of the chair to make them walk, and they fall on the ground, and everyone looks at you like you're one of the worst people on the planet, right? So there's all these there's all these uh, possible negative things that could happen to your life. Or you could sweep it under the rug, do nothing, and nothing bad will happen to you. In fact, good things will happen to you because you can continue billing this person and getting paid for it. So there's, there's very little incentive in this scenario for a physician to stick their neck out. The one incentive that I know is there is ethical practice. I mean, and malpractice, you can get sued. And I know some of these physicians are actually, you know, potentially target of lawsuits. Uh, or I'm fairly sure of that because they have a good case. Cause it's like, you did not do your job. And that resulted in a lot of bad things, including the death of this mother, because presumably if you, if all of you physicians had done something, we could have intervened, you know, and not, had it escalate to murder. So, so one of the things that physicians should, and, and therapists, frankly, should be thinking about is if you don't do something, it could come back to haunt you and you could get successfully sued because you didn't do anything, even though you saw the signs. So, uh, but apparently that's not enough because so many physicians, you know, we're talking hundreds of, of physicians who, uh, were exposed to this family, including social workers, police officers, you know, other kinds of people. And everyone had, you know, and, you know, a sizable percentage of those people had suspicions and yet did nothing. So, uh, so do I hold the medical community responsible? I would say yes. If the medical community had better systems of communication, because essentially this physician, he, he, he was like looking at it and he's like, I think, I think this might be Munchausen by proxy. And then he had to dig up old records. He had to specifically reach out to, to previous physicians, find them one and two, like talk to them and all this kind of stuff. Whereas if we had a massive medical database that had every single, and I know there's talk about this for a lot of reasons, you know, uh, another reason why we want a centralized medical database is because some people will, because they are addicted to Xanax or something, they'll go to 50 different physicians around, around Seattle and get, you know, 50 different Xanax prescriptions. And then they're, you know, rolling in a bunch of, of Xanax, you know, whereas if, if any of the physicians knew that this person was getting prescriptions with other, with other people, they wouldn't provide that, that, um, that, you know, prescription. Now there are centralized databases that can catch situations like that, but they're not as robust as I think they need to be. Now, the downside to that is if we have like a easily accessible centralized database of, of mental rec of, of health records, then it's, it's easily hackable, you know, like it, one, if all you'd have to do is hack into one site and you could get information on someone, you know, every bit of detail about their medical history, which not everyone would want out there. But, and I don't know much about this topic and maybe there's bigger movements afoot or maybe there are products like this out there or something. But it seems to me that in this case uh, of Gypsy and Didi, if there was more ready and easy access to all the various different medical documents that had been uh, provided over over and created over time, that 
it would have made it easier for people to zero in on the Munchausen by proxy diagnosis and to actually try to save Gypsy from, from that abuse. The other, uh, and also the fact that not a lot of people know that Munchausen by proxy exists because it is so rare. Um, so again, part of the reason why I'm doing this is I want to raise awareness about that. And this documentary will absolutely do that too. The other question here is, is the father to blame? You know, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, this father had contact with the family. Why didn't the father do something? Well, he definitely admits a number of times in the documentary that he regrets uh, not having done something. And, and he does feel responsible. But you get the impression from the documentary that the father was pretty distant to the situation. He, he met Dee Dee when he was 17 and they got pregnant um, accidentally and they got married. He was 17 when he married Dee Dee. And then a year later, he got divorced. So, you know, you're, you're 18 years old. You have a one-year-old daughter. Your, your ex-wife isn't so keen on hanging out with you. And so you could see how th things could kind of drift apart. And the father, you know, did stay in contact. Also, it's possible that if the father had done something, that Dee Dee would have figured out a way to manipulate the father out of the equation. You know, Dee Dee was, the, this is another thing you learn from the documentary on the various de details that they portray is, that Dee Dee was just a master manipulator. She was so, I mean, imagine all of the lies and the, the ways in which you'd have to be adept at manipulating people to, to, to get a physician to put a tube through your child's ad, abdomen, right? You know, these physicians, they don't just do anything. They have to be at least somewhat convinced that this, this you know, mother was just so good at that. Well, imagine if the father had started to say, Hey, I think, I think something's wrong. I, th I think I would, you know, I think I want to fight for custody of my child. Don't you think Dee, Dee is going to, you know, smell that coming and, and figure out a way to put an end to that? My guess is, is she would, I mean, an easy solution would be that Dee, Dee would just abuse Gypsy into saying that the father was sexually abusive or something. Right. And so I, I would imagine that there was, there, there was probably nothing the father could have done, given just the level of evil that this woman was, was capable of. So the last thing I want to talk about here is just about Gypsy uh, as she moves forward. One question that I think the documentary raises subtly is, is Gypsy herself just like her mother? And just like her mother's mother, is Gypsy psychopathic? Is she antisocial? Is Gypsy capable of doing a lot of bad things? Because there's this moment when she is telling her story to the documentary people. She's, she's in prison at this point, and she's being interviewed in her prison garb. And she's talking, and Gypsy's talking about the final moments just before her, her mother is murdered. And she's crying. And she's making a lot of noises like she's crying, but there's not tears at first. So she's making, you know, the, the way you act like you're crying, like, I'm crying right now, but no tears. So is Gypsy lying? She even says to the documentary people, she sits down and she says, actually, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I haven't told anyone the truth. I've lied to everybody so far, including my own lawyers. I've lied to my own lawyers, but I'm going to tell you the truth. So she's admitted to being a frequent liar. Now, the big question is, is this circumstantial in that she is in a very particular kind of situation? And once she's released from prison, you know, 10 years from now, is, is she going to have a normal sense of morality is she going to have a normal sense of empathy? Is she going to, is she going to have a normal sense of uh, give, give and take back and forth between other human beings? Hard to say. Maybe, maybe she will. Uh, or does she have the same compulsion to harm other human beings that her mother seemed to have? Because when you look at these texts between her and Nicholas, you, if you just read it face value, Gypsy is just as much of a monster as Dee Dee is. I mean, the things that she was saying, you know, she posted, she, right after the murder of her mother, she posts on Facebook that 
she she you know I, yeah i murdered her and she screamed and it was great and da 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 lol <laughs> i mean you know one of the creepiest usages of lol ever in uh, you know and so you know it's just it's hard to say uh did gypsy learn a very twisted sense of morality from her very twisted mother yes absolutely can can Gypsy unlearn that? Well, that's yet to be seen. Is it in Gypsy's bones? You know, is it hardwired into her brain as a result of biology and or environment? Is her psychopathy fixed or is it circumstantial? You know, it's, it's hard to say. The last thing I'll talk about here is I'm a little worried that this documentary will make people scared of BDSM. There's, there's some talk about Nicholas is into BDSM and Nicholas is not the best spokesperson for BDSM if you watch this documentary. And, you know, for, for, for the BDSM community, I'm guessing they're going to be like, oh boy, there's going to be a backlash on BDSM now because this Nicholas character is, you know, quite a piece of work and he's into BDSM and da 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 da, da you know, and we're just trying to make BDSM non-pathologized. And so I'm a little worried about that. I'm also a little worried that people will blame Gypsy for this whole thing. You know, there's talk about how uh, she's this master manipulator, and really, she's the victim here. Um, now, she murdered her mother, uh, so that's one. That's a hard one, you know. Or she hired or got someone to murder her mother. So that's obviously not good. Um, there were other options for, for Gypsy. She could have run away. She could have called her father. She could have just, you know, gone with Nicholas somewhere. But when I hear people talking about that sort of thing, I, I think, I think one thing, I think people like that have never been in an abusive relationship. If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, or you've been very close to people who have been in an abusive relationship, you know that it is so much easier said than done than to just than to just walk away. There's so many psychological reasons why it's hard to walk away. One, because your ego just gets bashed around and like just squashed, particularly if you're a gypsy in terms of you've been systematically abused and and controlled and broken down since you were born. I mean, you you've been you've been socialized to be dependent and and uh, were and to feel worthless since you were since you were born, so there's that. But there's also practical reasons that I I, th I feel like people don't often understand, which is that you know you imagine this: you have a mother who is capable of faking to everyone on stage, on the internet, on the news that your daughter can't walk, but you can walk, and your mother is is beating you if you if you step out of line on that you know if you start walking and your mother will take you home and beat you that is like some really crazy stuff right there right so that's just one of the things you know and then you're looking at all these other things like wait my mom might be faking all these other things and what kind of person does that right well when when you have a question mark on that like a more common example would be if you if you have a spouse and your spouse uh, just completely flips out because you came home five minutes late from work or something. And your spouse just completely loses their shit and starts breaking stuff and like takes the te a thousand dollar TV and throws it off the balcony. Well, that raises a lot of questions because you're looking at that person and you're thinking, that's not normal behavior, right? That's, that's extreme behavior. When they're angry, they're capable of doing things that are destructive to them. Well, if they're capable of that, what else are they capable of? This is the anxiety that is super justified in people who are being abused by somebody. So Gypsy is looking at her mother and going like, she is capable of such deceit and such evil and such, you know, she's playing the long con here. She is dedicated to this, to this project. She doesn't just lie every now and then. She is, she is a lifetime of lies. If she's capable of that, what else is she capable of? If I just go with Nick and we just, you know, ride off into the sunset, what is my mom going to do? Because if she's capable of manipulating people, she's going to go to the cops and she's going to convince them 
that Nicholas kidnapped me or that Nicholas is a sexual offender or that Nicholas raped her. And, you know, the, when you look at someone and you see that what they're capable of, it raises a lot of questions about what else they will do, which makes you very afraid of them. You know, that question mark of like, man, the sky's the limit in terms of what this person will do when, if I was to, if I was to upset them. And therefore it's easier just to stay with them and please them so that they don't do this, you know, mystery bad thing or kill this person, you know, which is what, gypsy decided to do now again i am not justifying murder uh the the real solution to this is for the medical community and perhaps for child protective services to just know the signs more and to investigate more if someone would have just if cps would have looked into more of the medical records or if this physician would have made it more of a long-term goal of like look i, I don't know if i'm going to do anything right now but i'm going to i'm going to reach out to a lot of other physicians and we're going to start consulting and you know, we'll start, we'll start talking to the school and, you know, if, if any person just would have made it their kind of uh, minor weekly project, you know, they, all they'd have to do is spend like 15 minutes a week on this for a year or something. They could have gotten to the bottom of it and probably put an end to it pretty early in, 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 in um, Gypsy's life. And so the, uh, now, murder obviously is not a good idea, but the, the lesson of this story is that uh, this could have been prevented. And in a highly sophisticated, industrialized society like the United States, you'd think we would be more sophisticated about this sort of thing. And now, I'm not saying that you know all these physicians are a bunch of idiots. I'm not saying that at all, because I could absolutely see myself in that situation, making a very similar choice again, because of the way I laid it out, it's just like, well, I could make my life very difficult or I can turn the other way and move on with my life and, um, you know, not risk having a bunch of bad things happen to me, you know? So there should be a different kind of system about that, like some kind of anonymous situation or some kind of systematic review process in which cases are reviewed by, an, an oversight situation or I don't know more education, more awareness, more testing, you know, just, just more of that kind of stuff. The last thing I want to say here is that Munchausen by proxy is a very rare condition. It is extremely rare. It's extremely rare that, that parents will do this because the vast majority of human beings have a tremendous amount of empathy for people and they have even more empathy for their own children and therefore would not want to do this to them. So, you know, it's a very rare thing. Um, but, you know, how rare is it? Because as, as, as I was saying earlier, it might actually be, actually be, you know, more prevalent than we know because there's a lot of people getting away with it. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Thank you.